Good evening. Hi folks, my name is John Carson. I'm the head of the School of Art at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this final uh, event of this amazing Open Engagement Weekend. I've certainly found the whole experience entertaining, informative and inspirational and I hope you have too. This seems like a happy crowd to me. I'd like to thank everyone who made it possible and who made it a success. That's the organizers, the funders, the hosts, presenters, the participants, and the volunteers. And special thanks to Jen de los Reyes for her vision and for her calm organizational presence. It's been a pleasure to have Jen as a visiting artist in the School of Art at Carnegie Mellon for a semester. Open Engagement is a massive organizational undertaking and I've seen Jen capably deal with problems and hiccups along the way without ever losing her cool. So take a bow, Jen. I'd also like to thank our good neighbours, the Carnegie Museum of Art, for hosting tonight's keynote lecture by Rick Lowe. Tonight's lecture is made possible by the Leper Lecture Fund. Robert Leper was a 1927 graduate of the Carnegie Tech, which is now Carnegie Mellon University. He became a respected member of the faculty at Carnegie Mellon from 1930 to 1975. Leper was an inspirational teacher who had an intellectually rigorous approach to creative work and encouraged artistic dialogue within the community. Russell Cameron, who was a student of Robert Leper, created the Re Leper Lecture Fund with a generous gift in honor of his mentor. And the Leper Lecture Series is intended to celebrate artists who expand the boundaries of artistic thought and practice and who provide articulate examples of social engagement as well as private searching to inspire the imagination. So in terms of social engagement, uh, tonight's speaker, Rich L Rick Lowe, is a truly inspirational figure. Initially he trained as a painter, but he shifted the focus of, of his artistic practice in the early 90s in order to address more directly the social, economic and cultural needs of his community. And with a group of other artists, he organized the purchase and restoration of a block and a half of derelict properties comprising 22 houses in Houston, Texas. And this became known as Project Row Houses. Over time, Project Row Houses has continued to develop, providing educational programs for youth, exhibition spaces and studio residencies, a residential mentorship program for young mothers, an organic gardening program, and an incubator for designs for low-income housing on land surrounding the original row houses. So consequently, Low revitalized a rundown neighborhood by creating a remarkable amalgam of an arts venue and a community support center, and it's still evolving. Additionally, he's initiated similar arts-driven redevelopment projects in other cities, including Watts House Project in Los Angeles, a post-Katrina rebuilding effort in New Orleans, and a community market in an immigrant neighborhood in Dallas. Lowe's work has been widely exhibited nationally and internationally, and his accomplishments honored with various accolades and awards. awards. Most recently, he received a prestigious MacArthur Fellowship. Um, something which you may have found already, and, and if you haven't uh, found it, please look for it. But uh, on your seats, there's a copy of there's a little scout book, and it includes an interview uh, between Lisa Lee and Rick Lowe. And it's very kind of insightful and informative. Uh, I've read it, I recommend it. Uh, so if there's not a copy on your desk, there are plenty of copies uh, around the room. So pick one up before you go. Um, you'll get some insight you know, from that interview and you'll also get some insight uh, from the man himself uh, shortly. Uh, Rick Lowe's pioneering social sculptures have inspired a generation of artists to explore more socially engaged forms of art in communities across the country. It's my great pleasure to introduce Rick Lowe. Thank you. Thanks for that great introduction and a warm welcome. So nice to be here with so many friends. I mean, it's such a great group of people. Nice to see you from all over the country. It's really nice. Um, 
I actually started this this morning uh, because I I wanted to talk about just some different issues that I've been thinking about, and I thought since I was kind of going a little bit off my usual script, I would follow the advice of a friend of mine who said that whenever you go in to do public speech speeches. Make sure you wash, wash your feet really well in the morning because you're going to put your foot in your mouth at some point. So, <laughs> so I did take care this morning, so hopefully I won't, you know, I won't, I won't, I won't have too much problem. But uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about seven things that just kind of, that I think about a lot or things that just kind of come up. And... Um, some of, them, some of them may be relevant to what you guys are thinking about. Some may not, but they're things that are on my mind. And um, yeah, so just kind of bear with me on it. I, the, the, the first one, I think, is probably a little bit, you know, everybody's a little tired of this first one because, you know, you hear it all the time. I, I'm assuming you do. Like, the question about, you know, whether social and community-engaged work is art. Is it art? It's like, you know, you hear that so much. Most people get tired of it, but it's been something that's been sticking with me for a long time. And, um, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, um, uh-oh. I spent, I spent a long time working on this presentation, and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and already I'm, I'm finding that I have the wrong Wrong images. <laughs> Maybe this is a different presentation. Um, <laughs> the slide that you should be seeing right now is um, it's an image of work that I used to do when I first started. I was doing paintings and sculptures that dealt with political and social issues. And, uh, and on the cover of one of the Houston magazines, there's an image of uh, these cutout sculptures and things dealing with police brutality. And the caption under it says, um, uh, says something like, artists, when artists are dealing with issues, are they making art or making points? So even back, you know, before I start doing social and community engaged work, I mean, I always had people that were kind of challenging um, my, uh, whether I was really being an artist or making art or not. So I'm accustomed to that, so I think about it all the time. And I, you know, so I always kind of think about ways to play around with it to see how I fit within this context. And so, th so this is this is one thing that I've been kind of playing around with a little. And some of you might have seen this presentation, me doing this before. But I'll just just play along with me. I'm sure you guys recognize this work, right? Anybody recognize this work? Brian's Klein. Who said that? <laughs> okay, good. All right, very good. All right, how about this one? <clears throat> Mondrian. All right. So, you know, I mean, you know, you see work like this and you just, you know, it's obvious that it has, it, it's obvious that it's art, right? I mean, and it's obvious that it has a certain kind of value. But if you look a little bit closer, yeah, the, the pieces on the top are Franz Klein's and very valuable work in some museum somewhere. But the pieces at the bottom of G's Ben's quilts, right? So these were works that were made by, you know, black women in the South, away from the art world, no value whatsoever until someone came along and and, and contextualize them in the art world. And then, I'll, and then, and now, you know, uh, well-deserving, you know, they've, they've been, uh, you know, featured in museums. So that's really, so it's kind of catching up. But at some point, it wasn't considered art enough. And then, and then this one, uh, Mondrian, yes. The bottom two are Mondrian's, the middle three, Mondrian's. But the top three, are actually 1852 pieces by kindergartens, German kindergartners. You know, and so, you know, so it took like how many, some 50 years, 50 plus years before, you know, this work that is, um, you know, that, that obviously has uh, a kind of value because we've, we've legitimized it in the art world, 
But, uh, but at one point, you know, I mean, it was these German kids had no value. So what does that mean? And I, I think it's a real important thing for us to think about, you know, in terms of, you know, who gets to determine what's art and who, you know, and what's not. And, uh, and for me, it's, it's an important issue. So I think about it all the time. I bumped into this, <clears throat> this um, quote from uh, a, an essay Lucy Lepard uh, wrote. And uh, so she was saying that she thinks the task of land art is to focus the landscape that is often too vast for the unaccustomed eye uh, to take in. And, um, and, and actually, you know, uh, it, further along in the article, Lucy talks about the fact that actually land art is for city folks because, you know, folks who live in the land, they don't need you know, some kind of art thing to tell them what it is. They, they, they know what it is. <laughs> so, but I thought that was interesting, this notion that, 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 that an artist can focus on something that can help people see things that they couldn't normally see. So I thought I would play that out a little bit. And I play it out in the context of ready-mades. You know, Duchamp's ready-mades, right? So if we just set the task of ready-mades is to focus the everyday object that are often too mundane for the unaccustomed eye to take in, right? You know, I mean, that's pretty much so what he, what he was doing by doing the urinal, you know? It's like, let's place it in a different context so people can see it. And so then I went back and I would take, um, took my iPhone and just kind of Googled urinal, and you get like just urinals, whatever. But if you Google urinal Duchamp, then all of a sudden you get like this special quality of a urinal, you know, where people are investigating and, and invested in it in a way that, you know, you wouldn't normally think about, right? So, so, that, so there's, a, there's a purpose and a role that artists, you know, do with kind of like focusing things. So then I thought, let's take it a little bit further and think about it in the context of social and community engaged art. Let's just say that if its purpose is to uh, bring into focus social and community um, actions that we've lost the capacity to take in, right? Because there's so much stuff that are happening all the time around us and we can't quite focus on that and see it for what it really is. So, so I did this thing where I said, okay, so since I Googled urinal Duchamp, let me Google row house low and see what happens. And then you come up and then you get like this whole kind of other, you know, thing about, you know, what a, um, uh, you know, what a, what a row house could be and its value. That is way different than you, you, you find if you just Google row house uh, on its own. So I'm very curious about this stuff. Like who gets to determine what's art and what's not? And, uh, and, and who's making it, who's not, where's the value. So then I, I, I look at things like um, my friend Meryl Eucalys, who, whose work I truly love and, and, uh, and been inspired by, you know, her maintenance work. And, uh, and I understand it, I understand how it works within the art context and the art world. But I also know on the right hand side, someone that we, uh, in our neighborhood, we call him Mr. Bentley, because this man shows up in front of Project Row Houses, uh, sometimes monthly or you know every other month or so, and he will show up and meticulously uh, manage the lo the grass around this bus stop, and sometimes he would be there for seven, eight, nine hours. Sometimes he'll he'll have a weed eater and other things. Sometimes he'll just have hand shears, and he would just get on his knees and he just he worked this he worked this thing for hours and hours and hours. But he didn't he didn't have anybody you know he's not calling up you know the museums and the art galleries and papers and stuff to talk about his art. He's just doing it, and it's something that you know that I've come to have a deep appreciation for. And I, so so then when I see. I look for things like this, and I often question for myself, you know, what does this mean? Does this have a value that is beyond what we normally would attribute, it, attribute to it? And what does that value mean in relation to the art world? So then I look at things like this. So on the 
right hand side there's William Pope L uh, crawling down the street but then on the left hand side I was walking down the street in Philadelphia one day and I see this guy walking along with this harness red train thing pulling a plastic container with a lot of stuff it was about 35 feet and he was crossing streets and everything everybody it was a true performance everybody had to stop and respond to him and you know so what makes these these things different I don't know so, but I, I will I, I, I will say this I, I, I will say this you know Lucy Lucy goes back and at the at kind of the end of her her article she there's this quote here uh, for years I've been muttering about my long desire to identify quote unquote social energies not recognized as art works erase wait, works that erase art world egos and ambitions what if we had no word for art would a whole important area of our experiences vanish or open up land art is a good place to test the idea since land artists often attempt to make their work look as though it has grown, grown there rather than being artificially created. Would art be less artificial if it weren't art? I, you know, I, I often, you know, I think about this quote in the context of these things that I see all the time on the streets, right? I mean, what does it mean without the artificial nature that we bring to things as art? And, and, how, do, and how does that impact the value of those things? These are just questions. These are things that I think about all the time because, you know, I find that, you know, while many people will say, you know, it's not a big, why are we worried about whether it's art or not? It doesn't matter. But to me, the, the stakes are high. I mean, there are a lot of resources that are attached to this thing that we call art. And there's a lot of power attached to it. Do, are we able to harness that? And you know, or do we just let it go? Do we just let it slip away? Now, you know, I, I, I don't know if we have the real capacity to talk about whether something is art or not, but we might be able to say whether something's good art or bad art, right? But then, if you do that, then you're probably slipping into the realm of taste. You know, it's like, whose taste is it, you know? And, um, and you know, I can tell you in the early 90s, mid 90s, the work that we're all sitting here celebrating and talking about now was not in the rim or the scope of what the art world considered something that was, had value. Uh, this is from an article uh, in the New York Times from an exhibition that I was in at LA MOCA along with um, uh, Meryl Yukalis and Mel Chen and Karen Finley, a few, a few other people. And, um, you, and you can see the title there. I mean, Roberta Smith, you know, she says there's a lot to see, but no artwork in, in sight. I mean, you know, what is that saying about, you know, about how, you know, about what people really thought about what it is that was coming to be? I think it's probably only natural because in the beginning of any emerging form, it's probably. Uh, you know, it takes time for people's tastes to catch up, right? It takes a little time for people to kind of figure out what it means and how to, how to value it. So, so that's, that's one area, one area of thought that I've been paying, giving a lot of uh, thought to is this thing about what is art. Now, the second thing is kind of leads into that a little bit, but I, I wrote it down as don't forget to, to thank the enemies. Now, <clears throat> see, this work kind of came out of a, uh, a cultural war of the early 1990s. And, um, and we, didn't, we, we, we didn't really, you know what, it, it's, it's really interesting that our enemies, as far as I'm concerned, I might, this is why I'm probably sticking my foot in my mouth, right? Because somebody's going to go out and say, oh my God, Rick Lowe's in there like praising the conservatives that, you know, that initiated the culture war. But I will say this, that, you know, at the time, you know, I was, I was with everyone else, you know, protesting, you know, and supporting uh, freedom of expression and so on and so forth. 
But you know, at that time, minority artists, cultural institutions or whatever, were getting very little support. The art world was, had turned its back, well, had never opened itself up to us. And, uh, and it wasn't until that war started that the art world started trying to, at, at least a part of the art world, started trying to figure out, you know, how do we, how do we stay afloat? I mean, you had people from all camps, you know, basically attacking it for being elitist. And, uh, and at that point, people start looking for ways to justify and to, uh, to look, at, look at art in a different way. So they were looking, and it was mainly artists who were out there in the forefront. And basically, because we were out there anyway doing it beforehand, I mean, before the, before the 1990s, there were already people doing interesting work. I mean, I can go, I mean, things that I'm connected to, my lineage is connected to all the way back to places like St. Elmo's Village uh, uh, in, uh, in LA. You know, and then, of course, just on the other side of the state here, uh, in Philly, Lily Ye was doing the uh, Village of Art and Humanities. Tyree Guyton was in Detroit doing stuff. So there were people doing stuff, but the art world had not, it, its taste had not caught up. And it was in the midst of this culture war that kind of forced you know, this new way of, uh, of thinking. So on the one hand, you know, it was, um, it was a, um, a pretty terrible, uh, it was a pretty terrible situation to be in where, you know, you're having to fight for, for things that weren't really necessarily fighting for you. You know, and that, that's, that's been the case uh, for, you know, quite some time in the art world. And so that's why I think it's important to fight that battle and to claim, you know, what it is that we do in the context, in its rightful context of the arts or in the field of art. Now, I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about oh, the third one. Now, the third one is a little tricky because I wrote it down as bullshitting and ass kicking. Right? Now, <clears throat> and, and the reason that I, I did that was because I think of this whole social practice thing as being, there are kind of two sides of it. You know, there's, you know, there's the art side of it, then there's the organizing side of it. Under the organizing um, uh, side of it, there's a lot of ass kicking, right? From the world that I came from. You know, when you're really doing your work in the community, you're probably gonna get your ass kicked. You should, because you can't, show up in a, new, in a new context and really grasp it completely without, you know, having some experiences here. And then on the art side of it is attached this mostly, it's mostly it's a fundraising kind of thing, right? You know, it's, it's conceptual, conceptualizing stuff, which has a tendency to turn into bullshit. Sometimes, right? So you, you start to bullshitting things about, you know, what, what does a project mean? And you make this stuff up. And, and it's not all bullshit because it's very valuable, right? It's very valuable because of the layers that we bring to art when we talk about it conceptually. I mean, that's where the value of it comes. But there's a tinge of bullshit there. You have to admit it, right? So, so, so okay, so when I, when I think about you know, my dealings with Project Row Houses. I, you know, I, I was, you know, on the left-hand side there, the image of John Bigger's work that was, that was the point of bullshit for me, right? It was the point in which I could start to, to, to think conceptually about a community building project in a way that departed from what normal community building projects are. So I can start to layer in all this meaning and value, connecting, uh, you know, t using the language of building a living John Biggers painting, and you know, talking about it as a, um, you know, utilizing some of Joseph Boy's bullshit, you know, uh, social sculpture stuff in it, right? You know. I mean, be, I mean, to be quite, I mean, I say that about Joseph Boyce because, to, to be quite honest, I've never really connected with his work, 
but I connect it with the language, and I think the language was way beyond where his work was. That's just my opinion, but, but uh, I, I, my feet are clean, so I'm, I'm okay. <clears throat> but, okay, so, so I, I was, you know, I was, you know, I was able to depart in this art world, in, in, in the art language, and to start kind of layering this and making it interesting enough that, you know, a group of, well, a, a, you know, a community of, you know, white, middle to upper class corporations and so on and so forth were interested enough in a low income black neighborhood of shotgun houses. It takes quite a bit of bullshit to do that. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> But, but, but so in the process of doing that, starting to kind of figure out, you know, how, you know, what, what value uh, uh, could it bring? The other, the other side of it, the other two sides of it too is that at its heart, Project Row House has always been about, you know, how do we empower, how do we help empower this community, right? But on the other side, to actually make it go and make it float, you know, we rely so much on patronage. And patronage is a funny thing, because it can trap us. And, uh, and I, think, um, I think you all might know what I mean. I'll get into that a little bit later, though. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so we, you know, we're very, very fortunate at... Um, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to bring something to an activist community that I was involved in, and I was getting my ass kicked on all this stuff, you know. But I got a little bit of reprieve because I had a connection to other resources that could kind of, you know, uh, uh, accompany the efforts that were going on, and uh, which put me in a very privileged place. And I always try to, I know, I know my privilege. I mean, my privilege comes with, you know, coming out of an arts. Uh, background when it comes to working within the third ward, um, where you know where my mentor uh, uh, Deloitte Parker, who runs, who's been running his community center for some forty plus years, um, you, you know, I mean, I have to support him because he didn't have access to the kind of resources that that I you know I can access, but. But through this, we've been able to offer things, you know, positive things within the growth of the community around architecture. There were these things that we looked at with John Bigger's work that I kind of teased out and talked about that was important in building community. It was architecture, art and creativity, education, social services, I mean, social safety net, and, um, and sustainability. So, and then within the arts, you know, we've had been privileged to have artists to come into this community and. And, and offer incredible, incredibly empowering and uplifting opportunities for people. And, um, but then also, you know, being there in that community and offering opportunities for those cre creative individuals to spring forth. The names of people there are just people that, um, uh, that, I'm just noticing that this is cut off a little bit on the side. Hmm. Anyway, but these are names of people that are uh, that that grew up in the Project Row Houses context, right? Oda Binga Jones and Associates, Robert Pruitt, Jamal Cyrus, Jabari, Jabari Anderson, Ken, uh, Kenya Evans, Autumn Knight, Levy Olivier, Robert Hodge, Nathaniel Donnett. I met one of his friends here. Where is she? Yeah, there she is. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, Onjabir Matwaya, the Flower Man, who's a, a folk artist, neighborhood folk artist, uh, Regina Agu, Billy Fortson. And then Trina Smith, the image at the bottom down there. I think of the, the range of people that we tr that that are empowered or, or 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 share in the empowering process. This young woman, Trina Smith, is a. I mean, she lived in a neighborhood, and uh, and a little bit depressed, until one of another one of my mentors, Jesse Lott, started talking to her about just drawing, just make stuff. And she, she just started and started, and now you know, she has an she has a emerging career as an artist. I mean, people coming by, checking out her work and stuff. Then education-wise, <clears throat> you know, I only need this one image to just talk about the fact that Frances Elijah Day, who was, who was a young woman that you know, grew up hanging out at Project Row Houses and education programs, and now she's, at, um, she's getting her PhD at Harvard, and, 
and, and leading consultant groups on education reform. She's a brilliant uh, uh, young woman. And then the social safety net. <clears throat> Being able to focus people on housing and the impact that that can have on people's lives has had a huge impact, I think, for our neighborhood. And representing that, just you know, a few images here, but I'll call your attention to the one at the bottom, Asada Richards. Left to right at the bottom is, left is a young, angry Asada Richards. Um, the middle is Asada Richards uh, finishing off her PhD at Penn State. And on the right is the Asada Richards who uh, is the co-chair of the, uh, of the Houston Housing Authority where she was appointed by the mayor. You know, I mean, these are, you know, these are people that, you know, have seen, seen the opportunity of seeing, you know, how and what happens, you know, when you, you know, when you provide opportunity over a long period of time for empowerment and to see how that kind of works out and comes back. The, the one thing, though, that I would say that if there's any failure of Project Row Houses, I would, you know, and, and, and being honest about it, you know, I would say that that balance between empowerment and patronage haunts me, right? Um, while there are many moments I can, I can talk about the empowerment, I also see that so much of what we do is on the backs of patronage. You know, and how far can that really go? You know, how long can that last? And, uh, and that's one of the things that's been kind of driving a focus of late in looking at, um, looking at supporting small businesses and helping people you know, who that we think will be investing in them now, they'll be able to invest in, in us in the future. You know, the other thing that I've learned about, about Project Over Houses is, um, and, and, and about getting, ass, getting your ass kicked, is it comes often and it comes hard. I, you know, I'll tell you a little story about someone that um, I, learned, I learned this lesson and I have to relearn it all the time. But the, but the time that I learned it, that, it, that it's kind of stuck with me and it's, and it's clearest, is through <clears throat> someone who's become a friend, and, but we kind of started out as foes. It's a guy that's about my age <clears throat> named Garnett Coleman. And uh, when I first moved to Houston, I, he owned a little coffee shop. Uh, and I would go there with my art buddies and we would roll into his coffee shop and hang out and whatever. And he, we, he was very cordial. And then a few years later, he ran for political office. And, um, and I supported his opponent because his opponent was more progressive and that's, you know, that's what I felt was the right thing to do. And so when I started Project Row Houses, he, had a, he was very cold to me. In fact, sometimes he was very, um, yeah, he would, he would be aggressively um, uh, angry toward the work that we were doing. But then after we start, and wait, by the way, he got elected. So he, 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 he won. So, so, that, so that, you know, I mean, he had a certain level of power there. So then, so over time, though, he started to realize that what we were doing was maybe it's a little deeper than, you know, that he, he needed to be involved because we started doing housing and he was in the state legislature. So he started getting us money for housing and then we started doing more housing and then he, you know, so then he started investing in us significantly. So one day he said, you know, we need to clear the air uh, because this is, if we're gonna work together, we gotta clear this up. And so we had lunch one day and, uh, and we sat there and he says, do you know the story of the chicken and the pig? And I said, no, <laughs> but I feel like I'm gonna learn. So, this, I mean, I'm gonna get it. So he's, he said, you know, there was once, the, there was this farm where this guy, you know, had a bunch of farm animals and stuff. And, and uh, on the farm, though, for some reason, the chicken and the pig became best buddies. And, um, and they were sitting there one day, the chicken and the pig sitting there, and the chicken said, um, you know, pig, why don't we, aren't you tired of eating this kind of, all this crap we eat for breakfast all the time, you know, all these seeds and all this stuff? We should eat something different. And the pig looked and said, you know, okay, but like what? And the chicken thought about it for a while and he looked back and he says, 
how about bacon and eggs? <laughs> and the pig said, wait a minute. You know, that's a gift for you. You know, you'll drop your egg off, but I gotta give away skin. I gotta give my body into this. And he said, you know, he said, when you came into the, he said, my, my family's been in this neighborhood for five generations. He said, you know, you, you come rolling in, you know, you drop in, you'll lay your egg. If it doesn't work out, you'll go somewhere and lay another one. He says, but you know what? I'm here. You know, and, and, and you have to honor that and respect that. And that was one of the first times that I, you know, that I really kind of understood, you know, what, what does that mean, you know, to be an outsider when you go in? You know, we're chickens, right? We're chickens, we lay our eggs, if they work, we may grow, we may, you know, gain something there and become more invested, or we may leave. So, but it's something that, you know, that was one uh, ass kicking that I kind of hold on to and I keep it, and it's very dear to me. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, okay, so now I'm going to talk about two projects here, but I'm still going to put them in the context of some things I'm thinking about. One of them is, um, is holding on to uh, core principles and, um, and, and, and relishing at the opportunity or time when, you, when your principles, are, when things are not quite fitting within your principles and you can say no. You know, because we have a tendency that we get so excited about doing work and we're excited to do any work that we can do that we just say yes. But sometimes it's great to like really know where, where you are and what you think and being able to say no. You know, it's, a, it's a proposal that I did uh, with a, um, a team of people. We were selected as, you know, the winner of the commission. And... Um, and it didn't quite work out. Now, and I, and, and I want to also say that I'm not being, you know, I'm not being critical of the people that were uh, of the institution. Uh, I think, I didn't think that our values lined up, and maybe they will at some point. I, I think they're great people, but it just didn't work out at this time. So I'm just going to show you, but how, how my investment, though, in the work that I do, I like to think of it as being, um, uh, vested in truly empowering people, you know, and how do you use, how do, how do I use the work that I do to actually, you know, uh, contribute in a significant way. So <clears throat> this project was a, a project, as you can see, the goals of this project were really exciting, right? I mean, you know, when I, when I read things like, you know, uh, integrating art into the everyday and the functional, um, uh, engaging residents and local businesses, and those kind of things were really interesting to me. And the, and, and the context was really interesting. Right? Uh, the story behind this little part of this neighborhood, and I'm not giving the name and the information here because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put too much out there, but, um, but it was, um, so apparently this neighborhood, I don't have a pointer, but Okay, so if you see one, two, three, four, those streets dead end there. Apparently, at one point, you could drive through all the way, but in the 80s, crime got so bad that they put barricades at those streets so that when you drove in, you had to drive back out the same way, right? But things have changed, and so they thought, maybe we could do something else with these, you know, these barricaded streets. So they wanted to do these things that cost uh, uh, gateways. Now, <clears throat> the initial context of this was in kind of a public art framework in which they wanted sculpture along these, um, these gateways, which was something that wasn't anything that I was interested in at all, but they convinced me to, uh, to submit a proposal. And, um, and after going there, this is what we submitted for them. First of all, we, just, we, we acknowledge the fact that at the gateways where, um, at these gateways were these little small buildings, and they were proposing that you would knock them down and replace them with sculpture. Right? But the problem with that was that as I walked through the neighborhood and talked to people, people kept saying two things. They said, first, the first thing they say is that we know why you guys are coming to this neighborhood. You're, ready, you're just going to run us off. That was the first thing. There was a suspicion. And then the second thing they said was that if you really want to do something in this neighborhood that makes any sense, 
you know, people need jobs. We need jobs, you know? I mean, we don't care about this other stuff. And so I've tried to take those two things, the